for entertainment, education, and information purposes only. And the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible to screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know the word. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. Hi, Matt. We'll just Hello. jump right into it. Hey, Shreya. So Shreya, hey, Shreya and Stuart with me tonight. The great Dr. Paul Williams had technical difficulties and had to bow out. So, uh, Stuart, I think that means you tell the audience what we do on this show. Oh, dear. Yes, we are an internal medicine podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Stuart, I think you're also supposed to tell them that uh, we spend the first few minutes um, talking about work-life fit, and uh, Paul usually reminds them that if they skip that part, they'll be a worse that's, person that's for That's pretty it. much the entire episode this time. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> no, we're the opposite. Okay. We skip through that part real quick. All right, Trey. So we'll tell, please tell them Just about our wonderful that. guest. Uh, Dr. Poorman is an internal medicine doctor at Cambridge Health Alliance in Everett, Massachusetts. She speaks Spanish and Portuguese and primarily works with immigrant patients. She is also a certified Suboxone prescriber and treats a wide range of addiction in her clinic. Um, in addition to her clinical work, she is a writer who's writing on topics uh, from origins of opioid crisis to sexism in medicine, has appeared on NPR, Stat News, Self Magazine, and The Guardian. She is a writer and a frequent guest speaker on depression in residency and has shared her own story with hundreds and thousands of readers across the world. You'll get to hear a little bit of her story later in this episode. Um, and yeah, we are very grateful uh, to have her and her expertise on the show today. Elizabeth, we've been friends on Twitter for a while now, but it's so it's so good to have you on the podcast. That's right. Thank you so much for having me. We wanted to ask you, just, just since the audience might not be familiar with you, can you give them a one-liner and maybe include something that you do outside the world of medicine? Sure. Um, I'm 34 years old, uh, originally from Chicago, trained at Cambridge Health Alliance in, uh, out just outside of Boston. And um, things I like to do outside of medicine include rollerblading and making pies. So, Oh, rollerblading. I love rollerblading. Yeah. I, 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 I time very, you did that? A week ago? <laughs> I, very care, I very carefully, very carefully chose to do it when it was no longer cool. So that meant I could do it forever. Oh, Very smart of you. I, I had some like expensive rollerblades when I was a kid that I thought were really cool, but I was too afraid to try any like tricks with them or anything but they were supposed they were trick skates but i did zero tricks with them except like maybe <laughs> skate backwards once in a while oh so fun i've been so i've been rollerblading along the charles for 15 years now <laughs> oh, oh goodness. very cool so in addition to rollerblading elizabeth what do you do for wellness or would you recommend to other people um in terms of a book activity yeah i think um it's a great and incredibly complicated question. Uh, for physicians specifically, I think first we have to acknowledge that our jobs are by their very nature traumatic, right? So we are taking care of people who are sick, who are dying, who are facing a lot of you know really challenging life circumstances. And so I think um, embracing that um, as kind of the core of our profession and thinking about, you know, how would you support yourself knowing that you're going into this kind of environment. Um, so I have an article I wrote um, called Congrats Medical Student uh, on Graduation. Now it's time to find a therapist. Uh, so I really do believe that everybody going into medicine and and actually starting in medical school should connect with a therapist um, knowing that they're going to you know face these kind of traumatic situations and have to uh, you know, process them, and they may not even have role models around them that encourage them to do that. But, you know, even purely as a performance issue, I think that that's really important. And then, you know, the other things that are important for anybody in terms of wellness, you know, sleeping, exercising, eating right. Um, and as we'll talk about in residency, that's incredibly challenging. So I don't say these things to, you know, shame anybody who doesn't feel capable of doing that right now. But, um, you know, I think it's, 
occasionally important to pull back in your life and, and think about, you know, what are you prioritizing? And, and while you're a resident, really having to prioritize your wellness over other activities. And then um, we may touch on this as well, but, you know, substance abuse is incredibly common in, uh, in physicians starting in residency and then, you know, beyond. So I think, you know, our, our tendency to, to make jokes about drinking and then drink with each other and then, you know, use, use alcohol to kind of wind down. Um, I would, I would caution people to really think about what role alcohol is playing in their life, especially during training. I did want to jump back, uh, to what you were just saying there about finding a therapist, because it's definitely something that I had thought about, uh, just sort of having, figured it was going to be a stressful point in my life and wanting to get through it well. Uh, I can say that I never did it. Um, and a big part of that was because I was just like, I was fearful about like finding out if people th thought I was seeing a therapist, that that meant things weren't going well and that I was, you know, that I was going to get in trouble or it was going to hurt my career somehow. Mm -hmm. Is there, how, how do you counsel people that are looking for that? I, I'm sure we'll get into it, but since, since you brought it up, I think now, maybe now is the best time. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to talk about that because that is probably the first question that I get from people when they're, um, you know, reaching out to me uh, to try to, you know, navigate some really difficult situations. Um, so there is very real uh, discrimination against physicians who uh, do seek therapy. Um, and at first, I'll talk about the legal discrimination against physicians. Um, so in the licensing process, um, the, I believe it's currently 28 states, and a few may have changed recently. But um, last I looked at this, 28 states asked if you have ever been treated for a mental health disorder um, in the licensing process. That being said, I think there are very few uh, people who have actually had their license uh, denied simply because they said yes to that question. Generally, you just have to provide more documentation. Um, and I I think that the existence of those questions actually discourage a lot of people from seeking treatment, um, and they're incredibly problematic. And the AMA has recently, you know, come out against them and and suggested different language that would be uh, less stigmatizing. And the other thing is that they're probably a violation of the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act. But in any case, um, that does exist. Um, and then, of course, you know, within our profession, there's a lot of stigma, uh, and you don't necessarily know how people are going to react when they see that you're, you know, seeking any kind of uh, mental health treatment. But I would say that, uh, you know, for me, the fact that I decided to tell my own story meant that no one else could tell it for me. Right. Uh, so that was really important. And, uh, you know, I, you know, people are gonna, you know, come at you with whatever misconceptions about a lot of different things. But I think, you know, if, if you are able to confidently think through, you know, as a physician who believes that trauma and mental health are real issues, you know, not to be dismissed or, um, you know, ridiculed or, or belittled, then it, you know, it's very clear that, you know, we should be, you know, connected to mental health resources, just like anybody else you would be treating. I wonder if just making it a standard part of like every training, just be like this, you know, every trainee is going to meet with a therapist at least once a year during their training. And then like that way, if someone saw you meeting with that person, it would just be normalized behavior. And it would also, you know, maybe you'd catch people early or something. I don't know if there's resources for that, but that just seems like a way when you normalize something, then it just will become more acceptable and people will be more likely to use the resource. I think it's also important to make sure that your staff are trained to recognize the signs and symptoms because, I mean, undoubtedly you're going to spend hours upon hours with these trainees. And so it's helpful to at least be cognizant of what some of the first presenting signs and symptoms might look like in these trainees. Yeah, I think the, the problem with that is that, um, you know, we have such an ethic of putting work before everything. That by the time you notice that people are struggling, uh, they've typically been struggling for a really long time. So, you know, I think about a friend of mine um, who was so depressed that on her days off, she couldn't get out of bed to eat, but never once missed work, never came in late and was an exceptional physician. And I, th I think that actually that ability to always put work for first is incredibly dangerous. 
And we've, that's all we know. Like we push through medical school, we push the residency with like sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. It'll all be worth it in the end. However, like how do you retrain your brain uh, to, to prioritize um, your needs and your mental health is, is uh, definitely, I think you'll hear in my story, something it took me a year <laughs> to do, unfortunately. Absolutely. Absolutely. To close, so to close the loop on the, the therapist thing is are are there programs that are doing it well or are, do you do you have ca- a, an example of a way that someone was connected either in, in a discreet way or just like a success story of somebody seeking help yeah absolutely i think that there are programs that are doing it incredibly well and um your hypothetical of programs where everyone uh, gets therapy is actually something that some programs are embracing um and i for me i think that that that's the most logical uh, thing to be doing uh, because so many of us are going to be experiencing depression or suicidal thoughts or you know even just you know trauma that doesn't necessarily rise to the level of a diagnosable mental health condition but trauma is de- secondary trauma is definitely part of our job um, so there are programs that are doing that uh, my program uh, at Cambridge Health Alliance uh, what we have are two psychiatrists who help connect people to um, therapy or psychiatry services either within or outside of the hospital system. And they, for residents, they don't keep notes. Um, so there's no electronic medical record that you may accidentally stumble upon. Uh, so they're doing a lot of things to really protect the privacy of the residents. Um, and then, you know, in other programs, it is just kind of a normal thing. They'll uh, give everybody a list of therapists and talk to them at the beginning about, you know, we're really expecting you guys to go to therapy at some point. We think that it's an important part of your training. You know, traditionally, psychiatry has been, you know, much better about that, although, you know, certainly not every program is perfect. But um, I think in internal medicine, it's time for us to embrace that, you know, that's an important part of being a professional is is taking care of yourself and acknowledging some of the things that you're going to be going through um, as somebody who's who's caring for the sick and the dying. Those are all um, incredibly important points. Um, And before we get started, I just wanted to um, have a disclaimer that, you know, this is an incredibly sensitive topic and we're going to share some of our personal stories and end on an empowering note of how can we work towards creating a supportive environment. But in case this is triggering for anyone, um, the National Suicide Hotline number is 1-800-273-8255. And if anyone wants to reach out in terms of what resources are available, Dr. Elizabeth Porman has made herself available so graciously, either via email, private messaging on Facebook or Twitter, which we will all link in the show notes, or any of us on Twitter, we are happy to talk and see that you are supported uh, in, in whatever way you need. Instead of getting to a clinical case from Cashlack Memorial, we thought instead it might be better to open up the discussion with our own stories um, if we're willing to share kind of our vulnerable times. However, kind of in lieu of that, I would ask the listeners to be respectful um, and kind of hear our stories without judgment. You know, everyone's experience of mental health is very different and shaped by so many factors. And I think the hope would be that we could have this conversation in a space with ears that are free of judgment and open to learning from these these stories. And we've already mentioned kind of some stories um, already. Um I, I can I can go first with with my own story that can I, I I think also highlight kind of the therapist stigma. So when I I started internier, I remember being in um, a room with a bunch of senior residents, and I asked them, like, "Hey, what do you guys wish you knew differently about like starting residency?" Right? And I, honestly, I was looking for career advice, but what the conversation actually went up going into was about being aware about their mental health, and like it turned out that basically half the room raised their hand saying that they were on SSRI. And I was like, one, very surprised because these are high achieving, like positive senior residents of mine who at that time did not fit the phenotype of who I thought would be seeing a therapist regularly or, or getting an S on an SSRI. And then two, I honestly wrote it off because I, uh, young Shreya was like, Oh, I'm so self aware. I'm, I have so much insight. I practice gratitude every day. I won't be affected by any of these mental health issues. Um, and then like, yeah, little did I know, uh, second year of residency. Um, and this is, maybe where my my case gets a little bit more nuanced, but I I knew I wanted to marry my now um, husband. And um, unfortunately, um, 
his last name uh, is not the right caste. Uh, and modern India and a lot of Indians don't believe in the caste system anymore. However, to one family member of mine, his whole identity was about being a Trivedi and, and, and a Brahmin. And so I, I grew up in a very patriarchal family where chronic like verbal abuse and threats um, were the norm. And obedience around those demands were basically reinforced all my life. And I had no idea the impact that would happen if I was to stand up for something in my own life. And I felt completely paralyzed. You know, if I got married, uh, would this person act out on threats? Uh, what would happen to my loved ones? And on the other hand, like, how long can I wait uh, for this person to understand? So I would, I would make these like really weird deals with myself. I would say like, okay, once I get off nights, and once I'm on Amcare, I'll have these conversations. I'll like stand up for myself. You know, I think I recognized early on, like when I was on nights or 27 hour calls, like I was so emotionally sensitive afterwards um, and like just didn't have the emotional bandwidth or energy. So I, I, I kind of delayed a lot of these talks until I just kind of became numb. Um, and the crazy thing looking back is that you know, it did, it wasn't like I would have suicidal ideations. Like, you know, I'd, I'd, it'd be 9 11 and I'd be at Times Square and I'd think, like, well, if I just stand here long enough, maybe something will happen and end this hopelessness. And like, it, or even like my patients, I remember would say, like, Dr. Trevetti, like, you're physically slow. And it really took, and this just goes to show how distorted my reality was at that time. It took not getting a position at work to really break the camel's back. I think it was like a sign for me that like I was not valued at home. I wasn't valued at work. And then like life was just spiraling out of control. And I will never forget those two months. I, I was just like in a complete fog and I'd like would be crying out loud uh, at night to sleep. And I, it was completely not I did not recognize myself anymore. Um, and so that it's funny. I say like, I don't, I won't forget those two months, but those two months were literally a, a fog of, of life. Um, but a couple of things that like helped me get out of that state and to have the courage to elope uh, against my family is, is one uh, finally seeing a therapist. And I, I think I have so much gratitude for all the people my colleagues who always said like, sorry, guys, I can't come to this meeting. I have to see my therapist tonight. Kind of like normalized it for me. Um, even though it took me, I should have probably gone a year before. Um, it was so helpful to find that courage and go through a lot of frustration and pain and, and be able to stand up for myself. And I think like a second thing was um, kind of starting the Core I Am podcast, having a creative outlet um, was Say, honestly saved my life. Um, just something where like some where, you know, my life at that time felt out of control, but just to have something, a, some outlet that was consistent, that was safe, that I knew if I put hard work into something would come out of it um, really, really helped me. So I think this, this story taught me two things. One is that, um, you know, talk and tell people you see a therapist, you never know who it might be helping. Um, and then to like having, having an outlet can be, I think it's actually been studied having a creative outlet in medicine can help, help prevent some of these issues. And I know a lot of people blame like mental, uh, mental health uh, physicians on the medical system, which is a huge part of it. But I think my story showed me that like, yes, people have life outside of medicine and might not have the most privileged backgrounds. And unfortunately, like medicine doesn't have a lot of wiggle room for when life things happen. Shrey, I want to thank you so much for sharing that. I know it's, I know it's a deeply personal experience for you. Um, but I, I think, you know, your story is very, um, is very specific, but it, you know, it touches on a lot of things that I hear from people, which is, um, first of all, that idea that that's not going to be me, right? So even while people are role modeling around you, um, and thank God that they did that, that it's okay to get therapy, that it's actually, you know, a part of being a, a, a good professional is to th take good care of yourself, that it still took a long time to, you know, kind of break through that. And, you know, certainly, you know, I had a um, friend that I really admired that, um, has started residency a year before me and really spiraled out and was, you know, incredibly sick, incredibly sick and was, you know, so vulnerable with me and sharing, you know, what she went through. Um, but, you know, before I experienced it myself, I think as a, a self-defense mechanism, I 
kept trying to think about all the ways that we weren't similar and that wasn't going to be me. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that I had her to, to talk to, um, even if I wasn't, um, even if I wasn't as receptive when, you know, when she was going through what she went through. So, you know, having gone through, uh, what you've experienced, you know, will make you, you so much uh, more available to people as an educator and as a colleague, you know, when they inevitably experience things. And I think the other thing you said, which is um, that as long as nothing else in your life is going wrong, you can, you can do, you can, you know, you can work those 80 to hundred hour weeks. You can, um, you know, do two hours of paperwork for every hour you see a patient. You can, you know, turn out discharges like that. Um, but unfortunately, we're human beings who have life circumstances. And, you know, sometimes we need um, a little bit more help and we need to step back. And unfortunately, I think that the pace of work, you know, particularly in residency, but this is a, a problem that continues forever, uh, that it makes it very difficult for us to give ourselves the space that we need to heal when, you know, difficult traumatic things are happening or, you know, even normal things like, you know, maternity leave or having right. the flu, you know, right. the, that that it's really hard to prioritize um, taking care of ourselves. And then I also want to especially thank you for, for talking about your, your, your family situation, because I think, you know, if a lot of your by, by nature uh, of how medicine is, you know, a lot of our role models and uh, supervisors are white men, and they can't necessarily, you know, relate to what we're going through. So um, as women or as underrepresented minorities. So I think um, the fact that, you know, you have this life experience and you're willing to talk about it is going to be so helpful for people who feel alone in, in the specificity of their suffering. Absolutely. Um, Stuart, did you have a, a story you wanted to yeah. talk about? You know, I was going to talk about one thing and then I, hearing what you're saying kind of made me want to change it just a little bit. When, when I was, before I was born my grandfather so his his wife passed away uh when she was like 40 years old um and about the year after i was born he tried to hang himself and this kind of like painted the way that i looked at suicide throughout a good portion of my life thinking that you know i was stronger than that that there was something innately just wrong with my grandfather he was a coal miner he came from a very poor family he tells me these wild stories about working with like, well, just wild stories. And I would just kind of like shrug it off. Um, and then I'd look at some of my family members and they were just weird. I, I've got a, a cousin with schizophrenia. Um, I've got other cousins that have schizotypal, schizoaffective disorder. It's very, very strong in my family. And so, you know, I would just think there's something just innately wrong with them. And, and I'm stronger than that. You know, I, that's not anything that I've personally dealt with myself. But when I met my wife, um, I didn't know this uh, at first, but her mother committed suicide when she was 15. And a lot of that that trauma, a lot of that history just kind of built up over the years and affected my own sense of self, self-worth, self-identity. And I started seeing a um, a chaplain, actually, when I was a first year medical student. That's this is just the first year of medical school. And looking back on, it, I'm thinking, my gosh, how in the world did we get through that? We had two kids at the time, and we both started seeing counselors at that time. Um, and there's a lot that got us through that. Um, mine is certainly uh, love for my wife, for my kids. But also understanding and embracing the fact that I'm I'm not perfect, and it's that it's it's the quintessential story of walking down the road and the perfectionist who's looking at every single bump in the road that misses the fact when he hits an intersection he gets hit by a car. Mm -hmm. But someone who's willing to look at look at the the cracks in the road and say, you know what, I'm going to trip every once in a while, but I'm going to keep my head upright, look forward, eyes squared straight, and I'm going to see the intersection. I'm going to see it before it comes and hits me. And that helped because in residency, um, we had another child, but unfortunately, we didn't know until about two years later that this child had severe autism. I got back from a deployment. So, I was deployed overseas. And so, yeah, if, if anyone listening to the podcast doesn't know, um, in the Air Force, I was deployed overseas and my wife was concerned. Uh, we got back um, 
And uh, it's like the house of cards just broke down around us. Both of us just destroyed. And as I'm trying to pick up the pieces of, of that, she and I went to counseling together. We'd been in counseling for about six months or so. And I, I, I couldn't bear the thought of this happening to someone else. It just, it would haunt me. Um, and so I would walk up and down the hallways at work trying to say, look, does anyone else need help? Because one thing that keeps me going is helping others as well. I mean, that's what gives me a sense of purpose, helping my wife, helping my kids. That's what helps to build me up. And there was one day, it was around 7 p.m., I'm walking by, and, I, and, and this, this colleague of mine, who I adore, who, who never would have, I, I never would have thought this. Um, he's the last person there and I'm walking by and I, and normally I'm hearing like keyboards typing this, uh, this colleague of mine is not someone to stay late. It's just quiet. He's the last person there. So to, to make a long story short, I walked in and, uh, um, he, uh, uh he, he was not planning on making it home that night. He was, he was planning on, on doing something, and, uh, you know, just some of the subtle symptoms I'd recognized in him, things I'd recognized myself just six months earlier, sat down, talked to this gentleman, um, and it was just, it was surreal. Just the whole thing was surreal. And it, just that, that one episode and everything else kind of up to, up to that point really changed my own career trajectory. I wanted to be a, you know, a, an academic GME physician, then coming to realize that we're the problem. At least that's what it seemed like from our, from my standpoint, that, that we inundate ourselves with all of these inane responsibilities because we want to say yes to everything. But when we start to shoulder that burden by ourselves, we realize that we can't do that. And we've got to be willing to, to kind of bear it all with one another, be more, a little more transparent, understanding that we, that there are, there's a breaking point for each and every one of us. I, I wholly ascribe to the idea that that counseling is is vitally important for trainees, but also trainees with family, as myself, because there is a a burden that your family does not understand, and it's difficult to translate that in a way that makes sense to them. And until you're until you're able to do that, you're not going to be able to bridge that gap. And that's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Stuart, for sharing that. That's a it's a really, it's a really difficult thing to go through, um, you know, and I think, you know, what you experienced with your colleague, you know, clearly brought up a lot of, you know, issues with, you know, your family history and, and, and trying to, you know, put that all into perspective. And I, I think it, it rings so uh, true for me, um, mostly what I hear about um, in terms of suicides are suicides that people have experienced of colleagues um, and suicides that were never called a suicide officially by the program. And I think that that is so hurtful to people. Um, and it's hard to know uh, how hurtful that's going to be. But, I, you know, I, I get approached by um, people who have been in practice for 20, 30 years. And the thing that they want to talk to me about is the person that they lost in medical school or residency that they know killed themselves, um, but they were never allowed to call it suicide because that same stigma that exists in our country, um, you know, we bring into medicine and, and, and perhaps even amplify it within medicine um, because we want to be perfect. Like you said, we don't want to say no. Um, and saying no is so important. I think the fact that we haven't wanted to say no is part of the reason that the environments that we work in have deteriorated so much because we haven't pushed back and said, you know, perhaps seeing 20 people in, in four hours is not actually safe. You know, perhaps, uh, perhaps this amount of documentation and, and, and such is not, is not safe. You know, where, where are the safe patient limits for physicians? Um, and, I think part of the reason that we haven't been able to organize for one another um, is that we we don't want to admit any kind of weakness in ourselves. And so it can make it incredibly lonely when you're struggling. And then I think, you know, you're absolutely right. It's very difficult on family members. It was, of course, very difficult on my family when I was struggling. Um, and I think, you know, there's certain programs have acknowledged, especially for partners, you know, your partner is the person that you go home to, that you want to talk about, you know, your day with. Um, but, you know, they, they get traumatized by the stories that they hear from us as well. Um, and they also need support, um, you know, and they're, um, 
you know, they're also going to need, you know, somebody to process things with as well. So I think that's such an important point. Um, and, you know, I wrote another piece um, called uh, What I Wish My Family Had Known About Residency. Um, and I wrote it um, because I received this really beautiful letter uh, from a man whose uh, brother who had committed suicide. Um, and he uh, really had wanted the program to openly talk about it and the program had declined to do so. But, you know, he, what he kept saying to me was, you know, if I had known what I know now about how common this is, I would have been a lot more worried when he told me that he was struggling, you know, and maybe I could have never stopped it, but I feel like I would have gone down there a lot sooner and checked on him. Uh, so I, I think that's really important for family members to know that, you know, that this is something that's going to touch a lot of us um, and that it's also going to affect them. It really like makes me think like when we have our white coat ceremony in medical school or I don't, I guess they don't do anything in residency where like all the family members come, but like, why don't all the deans like address this openly and like put shoulder some of the burden, not burden, sorry, it's not burden on family, but like really help them understand and prepare because, yeah, it's something I, I, I still struggle with the language of how do I make my family and my relatives understand? Like, I'm at a residency now, but, like, the, the, the stress and there's, there's just – there's so much – that is still there. They're like, okay, you're settled now. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not settled. The academia world is not, not any more forgiving. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, Elizabeth, did you want to share, share uh, a story of yours? Yeah, sure. I think, um, you know, for me, um, a lot of what I experienced was much more uh, specific to residency. Um, but I think uh, what I learned, what I've learned in retrospect and what I continue to work on uh, is thinking about empathy as a discipline. Um, so I don't know um, if any of you guys have experienced this or if any of your listeners have experienced this, but um, I'm the kind of person that if I walk into a room and someone is really sad or really angry or, you know, whatever strong emotion that they're feeling, I will walk out of the room, you know, carrying that feeling in myself as if it's my own. Um, and that is an incredible tool for me clinically, but um, it also makes it, you know, very difficult to work in a, in a high stress emotional situation. Um, and I think the, the lesson that I, or the, the, you know, mantra that was repeated to me in medical school was, you know, be more empathetic, be more empathetic, you know, be more emotionally present with your patients. Um, but I think that that is um a useful thing for people who don't have a lot of natural empathy. Um, and for those of us who do have a lot of natural empathy, actually what we need to do is to learn to manage that, to, um, you know, recognize, you know, what, what the other person is experiencing, but also, you know, maintain our own boundaries and our own emotional health. Um, so that was something that, you know, really, I think, played a lot into uh, what I experienced my intern year. Um, I speak Spanish and Portuguese, and a lot of my uh, patients are immigrants. And, um, you know, what what we were able to offer immigrants in America, you know, even though I was at um, a, a a program that, you know, really valued uh, taking care of immigrants and, you know, did as excellent a job as they could. Um, you know, they still face a lot of um, serious injustices. It's almost impossible to get dialysis. It's almost impossible to get a kidney transplant. Um, and, you know, on top of that, uh, the, you know, rhetoric around um, immigrants um, in the past couple of years has been very, you know, very difficult for my patients. Um, so I think, you know, thinking about those kinds of injustices, um, you know, and some of the, the really, truly terrible things that they were facing and I couldn't do anything, you know, for them, uh, both for my American born patients and for my foreign born patients. Um, I really took those things home and I was terrified of making a mistake. And so I kept, you know, staying later, staying later, double checking, triple checking, um, you know, and then, you know, really neglecting my home life. And I had, almost no support system outside of the hospital and I wasn't sleeping. Uh, so, uh, you know, things, things rapidly, you know, became clear to me that I was depressed. Um, but I think what was so fascinating to me both at the time and in, in retrospect was one, how ashamed I was that I was depressed because, 
Um, I felt, you know, like I was doing my dream job and I had no reason to be depressed. And what did this mean if I wasn't happy doing my dream job? And then the other thing was that um, so so many people responded to me um, and told me that this was just normal and that everyone who went through uh, medicine felt like this. And it was just, you know, part of the training process. And I think, you know, what's really interesting about um, experiencing a mental health disorder, um, if, if anybody has um, who's listening to this, is that, you know, you kind of lose your sense of reality. And so when you are losing your sense of reality, but then you also have to, um, you know, reject some of the messages around you that this is normal, that you're going to get through it, that you don't need treatment, um, that 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 was very unsettling to me. And um, when I got better, um, and or when I was starting to get better, we had that uh, f- those first couple of suicides in New York of uh, residents jumping off of buildings, and you know, I was looking, you know, I was looking around at at people that I I practiced with and I, and I realized, you know, so many of them had told me in confidence about, you know, what they had experienced, but they weren't willing to discuss it. And it seemed to me that that this was the true sickness. Um, And even in my deepest, darkest depression, I started taking notes and I felt like this was a story that I had to tell because I didn't want other people to experience this and feel like they were the only one. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing Elizabeth. And, um, I just, I I think amplifies why we need to continue, um, advocating for this and why this episode is also so important. I I had some comments just based on, I, I don't have like a really specific dramatic story. And I think in general, I've more been pro uh, prone to like, I guess sort of just like in general, these just bouts of, I don't, I don't think I would call it depression cause I don't think it would last that long, but it was just more always, uh, I think a lot of people in medicine are probably perfectionists, particularly internal medicine, uh, which is why yeah. we love like a hundred problem lists that we get to like make look beautiful. <laughs> hashtag, um, hashtag problem list. Right. <laughs> so oh, I hate hashtags. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I just think that most of my, uh, depressive symptoms or self-hate things like that um, I was able to use to become like a very good runner and to work out a lot and you know in some ways to to succeed in my career but certainly not the best for me and uh, so I I really think that that is something that probably a lot of people uh, probably in medicine also would struggle with and these periods uh, talking about suicide I don't uh, I don't think that I would have personally, I don't think I would ever commit suicide, but we were talking before about this passive suicidal ideation, mm. which I think is, it's a term that I like recently learned about. I was like, oh yeah, I think I've probably gone through periods of that because it's basically where you're you're acting in such a reckless way that you you wouldn't actively commit suicide, but you're not exactly like, you wouldn't be upset if something happened. Right. And, um, you know, I've I've gone through periods where my wife can just tell that I'm very sad and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, this is this is just me just, you know, being hard on myself. And um, probably three years ago, I basically just like, you know, this is also around the time we started the podcast, which kind of links up to what Shreya is saying, where I just like I needed to do something um you know, that I felt was meaningful and I was really doing a lot of like reading and how can I, how can I overcome these like periods where I just go through and this, you know, just constantly beating myself up because I, you know, I used to like, I, I used to think being a perfectionist was like an awesome thing, <laughs> but I no longer think it is. And I think it's like a, almost like if I was at an AA meeting, I'd be like, I'm a recovering perfectionist. Um yes which uh, those of you who work on the show, if you if you see that from time to time, I apologize to you. But that's okay. Um, it is, yeah. So I, I think a lot of people go through that. And, and for me, the, the negative self-talk thing has always been the biggest. So a lot of things that I've read and a lot of like practices and things, I've learned to recognize it and try to overcome it. And I'm sure that, that if you have a perfectionist who's fighting an uphill battle in a medical system, which we've talked about, where they want you to see mm-hmm. more patients and do more paperwork than you possibly can, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think that's uh, certainly um, 
certainly contributing to this this problem that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah we were talking about uh, before we started recording that one of the things that my job allows me to do is actually speak with physicians, talk them about burnout, and just kind of privately ask them about their own history, what their thoughts are, and everything's confidential. But interestingly enough, uh, the majority of physicians that I speak speak to say that at least sometime during the training or during their early staff careers, specifically or early staff careers, they do have these passive suicidal thoughts. It's not something that's unique amongst one or two physicians. It's it's pretty much a shared um, a, a shared issue and. The uh, uh, burnout surveys that that we give these physicians, nurses, technicians, LVNs, etc., the highest burnout is typically seen in these younger physicians. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a shared you mean thing. Er- early career physicians, right? yeah, early career yeah. physicians. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just I just think it's and you know to describe the feeling again, um, it's just one of those things where it's like, gosh, I I would never kill myself or I don't want to kill myself, but. If something happened, it would just be so much easier. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I can say that, uh, you know, I have not had a period like that for quite a long time. Um, now that, you know, once I started sort of like doing things to try to get and be open with my wife about talking about, you know, when I was struggling and she'll she'll point it out to me uh, when she notices changes. So. Matt, I thank you for thank you for telling us that. I think um, you know you bring up a really important point, which is that um, suicidal thoughts and depression um, often coexist, but they don't have to. Um, and I think you know, particularly um, when we think about sleep deprivation, um, you know, you can have what sleep deprivation is a, is an independent risk factor for suicidal thoughts, um, particularly. Um, so I think when we're thinking about work hours and how residencies are structured, and um, you know whether or not we shame residents for taking naps in the hospital, um, that you know we need to think about the the risk to their lives um, when we do that. Um, but I think you know. Also, you know, a lot of times when people do commit suicide, you know, what is the thing that we hear from their colleagues? It's, you know, that we would have never suspected, right, that they were the last person that we thought that would do this. So I think, you know, just because someone appears to be outwardly doing well, um, oftentimes those are the people that you need to be the most concerned about. So, Elizabeth, we're... I, we're talking about depression, mental health, suicide. Can you tell us just a little bit about like what the the life cycle of that's like um, in the in the career of a med- someone in the medical field? Yeah, so I think I would summarize you know what I've learned about this topic by saying that depression and suicide are occupational hazards of uh, training and practicing medicine. Uh, so you know when we pick people to be medical students, we're naturally selecting for healthier people with better support systems, you know, people who are smart, generally people who have not experienced a major illness, um, including mental illness. Um, And then during medical school, you know, we see our first big jump um, in uh, mental health disorders. And I just want to, you know, point out that a lot of people think about, you know, how do we select for healthier people so we can prevent this? We are already doing that. So that's not the problem is is in student selection. The problem is in the actual training. Um, and that probably peaks in the clinical years um, around third year when there is, you know, some abuse. Um, and then, you know, people are, are also experiencing death and dying in a very real way for the first time. Um, And then things get better. And then uh, in in a turn year, we actually have the biggest spike that we know of um, for, uh, you know, people going through this process so that, you know, when we start intern year, only 4% of us are going to qualify as having clinical depression. But at some point in intern year, 41.8% of interns are going to have clinical depression. Um, and I think, you know, those numbers, um, if they should, if they surprise you, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad because I think, you know, if we really wrapped our head around how big this problem was, how common it was, you know, then uh, we, we could start acting differently about it. You know, and then what happens in the rest of residency is a little bit less clear. We don't have as good a study, but um, in the early career, which we were talking about before the break, um, 
people lose their support system, you know, and, and something that was very surprising to me is, you know, you kind of also lose your sense of purpose. You know, you have this like external purpose, you're in a, you know, a high stress environment, but an often very rewarding environment where you're, you know, you're saving lives, you're teaching, uh, you know, you're connecting with colleagues, and then uh, suddenly you're alone. Um, and I, and this is more drawing on um, stories that I have heard, you know, from around the country, but there does seem to be a big spike in suicide in that first year that people are out in practice on their own or um, in fellowships. Um, and then, you know, depression and, and suicidal thoughts continue to plague us uh, throughout our careers. It's something that's something I wish I had known finishing residency. I'm pretty like aggressive with mentorship and whatnot, but I wish I was like, oh, I'm just going to fellowship, man. And then like it, this, yeah, the, like the the purpose and the like the existential. I can't even describe what happens, but Shreya, I just the yeah. This there's a book by uh, Sebastian Junger. I think that's the author. It's called Tribe. And uh, I heard I heard him interviewed, and I, I mean, I've read the book, and I heard him interviewed talking about it. But he talks about these these young young uh, soldiers who are on the front lines in like really intense conditions where they were almost horrible living conditions, where they're getting like they're in right. firefights every day, and they come home and they lose. They had such a sense of like being tied to a community and right. and to going through this shared awful experience. And such a strong bond that that when they went home, they just could not experience that same bond. And Elizabeth, I think that's kind of what you're describing on a, a little bit of a less intense level when you leave a training program where you where most people might might feel they have that. Right. Yeah. Um, Jamie Riches um, is a is a physician in New York who wrote a really beautiful article about losing a colleague to suicide, um, and. Um, she was saying that, you know, working with people who had actually, you know, been in uh, the army as, as you guys have, um, or been in military as you guys have, um, and then, um, you know, thinking about how PTSD and trauma are, are similar or not similar, you know, what they said is that, you know, when you're in war, war ends or you go home, but, you know, death, dying, disease, you know, the, the, the difficulties of working in the hospital, that's, that's constant. It never lets up. So, um, you know, so I think there are some interesting lessons to draw there, but there's definitely, you know, distinctions. And, you know, it's actually, it's been a very humbling experience for me to try to continue to do this work as a primary care uh, physician, uh, because, you know, I feel like I've kind of wrapped my head around the training environment and, and, and ways that programs can be more supportive. Um, but, you know, in primary care, it's a very difficult problem. Um, and I, I remember, um, you know, thinking about this, I, I was having a conversation with um, Elizabeth Metro, who's a uh, researcher and speaker who works at Primary Care Progress. And um, she kept talking about loneliness for physicians that she was connecting with. And I think, you know, I would say that, you know, in residency, the problem is exhaustion. And in uh, practice, once you're out of residency, the problem is is loneliness and isolation. I I think maybe we should jump to some of our, our, our many cases to help us kind of practice and navigate these these hard situations. You know, I think a troubling point is that, uh, or a pain point is that uh, I think we've all heard supervisors or people in leadership positions that have said like, yeah, you know, we used to work like these hundred hours, like wake up after like a four hour nap, not complain or be depressed. You know, these these medical students and residents are just are just weaker. Like, you know, they have duty hour. Uh, we didn't have these things. You know, what what do you say to that type of thinking? <laughs> I think it comes from a, a place of wanting to be self-protective and 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 not willing to really confront how big this problem is. So I I understand, but um, I will say first that you know probably a lot of them were in programs where their own humanity was also denied. So you know when they were struggling, uh, when they you know really needed help, uh, the response was you know just suck it up. Um, and I think you know I. I, I hear from from uh, people that kind of phrase it as, um, you know, when I was struggling, nobody cared. 
Um, so you guys just, you know, need to pull it together. And I, I think what they're actually saying is, you know, no one had, um, you know, kindness or empathy for me. Right. And now I don't have it for you. Um, you know, which I think, you know, especially, you know, I work now with a lot of uh, people who experience trauma and um, I can kind of recognize that as, as sort of the generations of, of trauma that we've experienced in, in medicine. Um, so I think that's the, the first thing. Um, and often when I talk to, you know, people who do say that in person, they will eventually come to the conclusion that they were also depressed in residency. So that's that's also an, an interesting experience for me. But um, the, the second thing I would say is that, um, you know, I think I think most people have acknowledged that actually the, the clinical environment has gotten a lot worse um, and it's particularly gotten a lot worse for residents you know, because the amount of work uh, and especially the administrative amount of work that we're expected to do has just exploded. So, you know, residents, um, I think it was an uh, um an analyst paper a few years ago that found that residents spend just seven minutes of FaceTime with each patient, um, that we're doing, you know, two hours of documentation for every hour of, of clinical care. Um, I think that's from AMA. Um, but we're also doing more admissions. Um, people are spending fewer days in the hospital. Um, and then the pace of medical knowledge is just, you know, rapidly increasing. So, in 1980, you know, doubling time of medical knowledge was seven years, and now it's closer to 73 days. Um, so if you're, you know, you're trying to keep up with all of this, um, you know, if, and then I think we're just sort of reaching these kinds of natural limits of what the human mind can can do and handle. Um, and, and I think, you know, duty hours were a really important and uh, thing for uh, governing bodies to do, but they're not enough, and they don't deal with this problem of work compression, and they don't uh, deal with you know what are safe limits for you know what physicians can do to you know to take care of patients. Um, so I think you know we need to be physician centered and patient centered when we're thinking about you know what's a reasonable thing to ask of residents. Is have you seen or heard of changes that are going to be? Uh, that are going to be enacted to hopefully make some of this better. I, I mean, I agree with you. I think the work compression is just such a problem. I, I was talking to a resident that uh, at Cashlack one time, and she was telling me that she really felt guilty that she wasn't spending enough time at the bedside with her patients. And and I told her, I was like, you, you need to take that guilt off of yourself. Like, I, I can't imagine someone working more efficiently than you do or harder. And I, there's the system is not set up for you to spend a lot of time at the bedside. And, and that's something that people are hopefully working to change. I know I plan to uh, use the microphone to help influence that as much as we can, but this, you know, it, the, the residents are feeling that way. And I think, I think uh, not just residents, I think probably all physicians are feeling that way to some extent. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think at, at least, um, at least um, we're stepping away from that perfectionism that, you know, keeps us from being honest about our own vulnerabilities. And I think that that's, that's the first step because, you know, naturally any system, right? You want a system where the average person can provide excellent clinical care. And instead what we have is a system where, you know, only the superhuman can make it through and provide the kind of care that, you know, we would want for ourselves and for our loved ones. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's really problematic. So I think that, you know, there are some positive changes definitely happening on the residency level um, in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, creating a healthier clinical and learning environment. Um, in terms of, um, you know, people actually in practice, there's definitely, there's definitely movement. Um, but I think, you know, we struggle with defining the problem. Um, and we struggle with, you know, taking responsibility for the fact that, you know, there is just a certain amount of work that's not reasonable to ask people mm -hmm. to do. Um, and I and I I wish that, you know, when we're talking about burnout, we're talking about, you know, those external factors. If we could, you know, start there and say, you know, what what can we expect from people? That kind of begs the question, too. So if let, let's say that you're that intern and you're signing out to another intern and you, you notice this other intern's making mistakes just seem slow. Um, you're worried that there's something going on. What can you do? How do you navigate that kind of a situation? 
Yeah, I would I would first say that um, by the time people are making mistakes and you know they're they're visibly struggling, that they've probably been struggling for a while. They're probably a lot sicker than you realize, um, because as I'm you know mentioned before, um, people will physicians will prioritize work over everything else. Um, so you know if they're at the point where it's visibly affecting their work, um, then they've probably been sick for a very long time. Uh, so that's the first thing to think about. Um, and I would say I don't really have, you know, particular phrases that I, I say to people, but when I am worried about them, I, I try to think about those conversations that I felt were healing for me. And, you know, those were largely conversations that didn't take place at the hospital. You know, people made time to, you know, speak with me outside of the hospital um, and, you know, really just check in and say, you know, how are you doing? Um, you know, it seemed like maybe you were struggling and I want to share with you um, that, you know, I, I've certainly experienced that. Uh, if it would be helpful to you, I'd like to tell you about, you know, what I've experienced as well. And then, and then I think, you know, as Shrey was pointing out earlier, um, if, if people just make it a habit of openly talking about their vulnerabilities, about talking uh, about going to therapy, then it's so much easier uh, when somebody really needs it. Um, you know, you've really you know, practiced what you preach to, to, to talk to them about, you know, getting connected to care. Yeah. I think the one other thing about this case, because we do a similar kind of uh, case OSCE, um, what I find is, is that a lot of... Um, a lot of trainees that are going through the case and including myself, because I had to go through this case as well. Um, I think I'm upsetting some people about telling them what they, one of a, what the OSCE is about. But I think the, the hard part is um, with these colleagues, it's so easy to normalize what they're feeling, which is important. However, taking that extra step to also just say like, hey, are you having uh, any thoughts of hurting yourself? Um, is so important because can you imagine if that was the last conversation you had with this person and then something happened to them? I think um, it's. I think there needs to be a, a step where you take yourself out of the kind of friend colleague role and maybe put on the doctor hat a little bit. Um, is maybe what I would I would also add. Yeah, I think that that's so hard because. Um, we have so many blind spots um, about ourselves and about our colleagues. Um, and I, but I think that, you know, suicide is so common in our profession and certainly suicidal thoughts are so common in our profession that it behooves us as, as colleagues and especially as administrators to think proactively if somebody is in that situation, you know, how are we going to handle it? Um, because I've heard so many stories from people who have said, you know, they were suicidal, they disclosed it, and they were told that they had to go to the emergency room at the hospital that they work at. Hmm. And sometimes, you know, you're in a very, you know, rural place training, and, and it can be very difficult to, to think through. But I think, you know, just taking that, you know, extra time to really, you know, sit and, and think through, like, how are we going to manage those kinds of emergencies that we're necessarily going to encounter um, if we're involved in training or if we're involved in, in medical practice? Like, that can, that can make such a difference. And then um, responding compassionately and thoughtfully to somebody who's really struggling. Can you highlight a couple? I, I know we're running out of time here, and I wanna I wanted you to highlight just a couple of the programs that are doing things well to address mental health and suicide in in trainees, and then maybe we can end with some questions from social media. Absolutely. So, um, the program that's been written about the most, and I think is it serves as a really uh, fantastic model, is the Stanford General Surgery Program. Uh, so. They, this was a program that was um, touched by a, a suicide of, of one of the residents and, um, you know, very, very difficult for them. Um, and the program responded by um, creating these uh, debriefing sessions for their residents. Uh, and these sessions, importantly, are run by mental health professionals who 
uh, don't have other roles in the residency. So they're not evaluating residents um, because I think sometimes these debriefing sessions are run by chief residents or they're, you know, run by other administrators or attendings. And and then people can feel sort of uh, pressured to to not share, to only share specific kind of um, experiences. So um, they they create those kind of um, safe environments. And then those mental health professionals can serve as liaisons for connecting people who need, you know, more help outside of uh, those kinds of debriefing sessions. But I think that that, that program has really acknowledged that. Um, and then they also, uh, you know, do things like stock healthy food in the refrigerators. And um, importantly, they let the residents evaluate the program um, and make sure that it was um, appropriate, you know, that it wasn't somebody in practice deciding what was going to be helpful for residents. Um, It was the residents themselves deciding what's going to be helpful for them. Um, And then uh, Boston Medical Center, I know, has done a lot of work about reducing paperwork for residents. Um, so along the lines of uh, thinking about, you know, saying no and, you know, what are safe limits and and just, you know, pushing back a little bit on some of these uh, mounting administrative tasks, um, they've really embraced the idea that, you know, residents should be spending their time at the bedside, should be spending their time learning. Uh, so taking seriously, like, you know, getting outside hospital records, is that really a resident job? Um nice. Yeah, I'm just saying standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that I think that that's been fantastic. And you know, at, at Cambridge Health Alliance, I think like we talked about before, um, we have those psychiatrists who have really you know opened themselves up to uh, helping residents get connected to care and really being incredibly proactive about saying we're going to do everything we can to protect your privacy um, because it's incredibly difficult to protect the privacy of residents. They work in almost every department of the hospital. They know everybody. Um, So if you are not twisting yourself into knots, thinking about how do we protect residents' privacy when they're seeking mental health care, you're not protecting their privacy. And I think that's something that administrators really, you know, need to know and understand. And then also to ask, you know, chief residents and program directors to not make themselves into unintentional barriers for people seeking care. So, you know, I've heard about in many programs, uh, program directors asking, Uh, telling people that they need to get permission to go to therapy um, or that if they're going to therapy, they need to talk to their chief residents. Um, And I just, I don't think that that's appropriate. And I think that, you know, while some people will still access care, a lot of people who really need it won't. Yeah, we we have to make the bar lower because if you take a depressed person who's probably not feeling super motivated, you know, it's going to be hard for them to if it's really complicated for them to get care, it's a huge bar, especially if there's social stigma and implications. So I, I mean, that's a huge, if listeners have um, suggestions about that, please send it out on Twitter or comments in the show notes or whatever. It's I'm like, I've sat on my like therapist couch and I'm just like, can we like telehealth? Like I had no energy today to come in, but like <laughs> I had to like drag my, she's like, Hmm, that's an interesting idea. And I was like, yeah, let's tell her. That's not a bad idea. Cause then no one needs to see you go. You can also bill for that. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's a great idea. And I think, you know, sp- especially in rural programs or programs where, um, you know, the whatever hospital system you're working in has uh, a monopoly. So it's very difficult to go outside of the system uh, that there's a lot of enthusiasm about um, telehealth. So I think, you know, every program can make this work um, in, in a thoughtful way for their residents. And I and I think, you know, if you, if we're not willing to provide that, it's sort of like, you know, telling firemen like, well, we can't just we can't afford the protective equipment that we need. Like you can't have a firehouse if you're not going to be willing to do that for people. This that would be a great project for some one of the listeners to take on. Create a national telehealth network for uh, physicians and trainees who need mental health help. That yeah. would be That's build it to an app. Be the next gold humanism grant. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> let's let's All right. do it. Yeah. So um, let's let's transition to some some questions from um, our our listeners on Twitter um, and in, in the email. Um, I think this is an important question that I. It's easy for me to say and call things burnout, but why should we not call it burnout and what should we use instead? So um, this is, you know, this is an area where I think reasonable people disagree and a lot of people do great work um, under the umbrella term of burnout. 
I specifically have chosen to stay away from it because um, I think it can be confusing. Um, I want to talk about depression. And I think as physicians, we understand what depression means. Um, and and we, we understand the severity of that and, and the need to respond and to get treatment and also to prevent it. Um, my concern about burnout you know, specifically as a clinician who who takes care of other clinicians, uh, is that I sometimes see people who are clearly depressed calling themselves burned out. Mm. And, and it, you know, I think in those cases, it, it is a dangerous euphemism. I also think it gives the administration some cover to um, think about this as a less serious problem than it is, whereas it's very difficult to deny the seriousness of depression and suicidal ideation. Right. Another question was, will getting treatment affect your board applications? Yeah. So we, as we did mention before, there are states that specifically ask about uh, mental health disorders and mental health treatment. Um, And so I would say first, you know, don't lie because that puts you in a vulnerable position. Uh, But second, you know, disclose only what you have to. So um, in Massachusetts, for instance, there's a question that says, do you have a condition that would impair your ability to practice medicine? Um, And that was written in a vague enough way that I didn't really know what exactly they were asking or how I needed to answer. Um, And I will say it took a lot of work um, while I was writing my piece about my own uh, depression and investigative journalism to actually get a straight answer. Um, But the answer to that question is no. So you, you are being treated appropriately. Having depression doesn't mean you can't safely practice medicine. Um, the second thing I would say is that, you know, even in those states that do ask about this, they very rarely deny your license application for that reason. So, you know, be honest. And then if you are worried, I would consider getting a lawyer um, to, you know, help you, uh, you know, get through that process. Okay. Well, I think we've given like a pretty thorough and wide ranging uh I guess more wide ranging than, yeah, we've given a pretty wide ranging discussion here and a lot for people to think about. And certainly all of us are available on social media if there's follow up questions and uh, if people have suggestions for future episodes or something like that. Um, But we should probably get your main take home points now just so we can be respectful of your time and let you go. Sure. So my, my main take home point is that this is a problem that's going to affect most, if not all of us, um, whether or not directly, it's certainly going to affect our colleagues and our loved ones. Um, so don't feel like you're the only one um, and you know, be proactive about taking care of yourselves. Uh, that, that's my first point. And then you know, my second point would be that you know, therapy is a really great thing. Um, it is a, a thing that can you know, sort of uh, help us you know, be better physicians, even in times when we, we may not have a diagnosable uh, mental health disorder. We're certainly experiencing difficult things with our patients, with our family members. Um, so I think that that's an incredibly um, important resource and tool for us. And it's important to seek it out before you're depressed and you may not have the energy to do that. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think the, the third thing is to think about, you know, if we're telling our patients that mental health is an important uh, is important for us to take care of, that depression is real, that, you know, whatever um, psychosocial or psychiatric distress they're experiencing is legitimate and deserves treatment, um, then we need to start acting that way amongst ourselves. And we need to start, you know, bringing that kind of compassion to our colleagues. Otherwise, it, it certainly rings hollow for them as well. I think that's a great way to end. And thank you so much. Thank you, guys. That was that yes, was excellent, you. Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> Yummy. I thought Trey was going to do it. Oh, Get okay. show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our show notes in your inbox. I was too hungry. We're committed <laughs> to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. Yes, you listener, you 
the one listening. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks goes to Shreya Trevetti and Nora Toronto and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams on Twitter, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on Instagram, and Chris the Chew Man Shoe on Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. <laughs> The special thanks was because Shreya and Nora wrote this episode uh, <laughs> and produced the episode. Oh, uh, yes. And I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And, and I I'm suck Dr. at reading the outro. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm Dr. Shreya Trevetti. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Good night to Paul out there. I Good know. Night, Paul. Poor Paul. Aw.